Welcome to our lecture 35. Um, this is uh, on the biology of sexual orientation, and here's where we get into, you know, making some application of uh, what you've learned. Uh, that is to say, we've taken a look at the principles of sexual differentiation. Uh, we've taken a look at how this uh, applies to lower animals than to the case of human beings. And now uh, what we want to do is we want to tackle that all important issue of the degree to which sexual orientation <clears throat> may have a, a biological basis. So let's begin uh, that exploration uh, by first taking a look at it in the case of uh, males. And I think a logical place to begin is to explore the contribution that testosterone might play to sexual orientation. In other words, the question we're asking here is um, if you took a look at homosexual males and heterosexual uh, males, um, uh, is there any relationship at all to uh, levels of uh, testosterone, let's say during uh, adult life or during pubertal life? Um, and indeed, uh, many in this area would make the prediction that uh, uh, there's probably you know some differences that we see in the testosterone uh, values uh, uh, in males that are homosexual versus those are that are heterosexual uh, there have been a number of studies that have been done in this area for example where they've taken a look at pubertal levels of testosterone and sexual orientation and uh, what they do is they take uh, males that are avowed homosexuals, um, uh, take a look at their testosterone levels, and take a look at uh, uh, males that are avowed heterosexuals, um, take a look at their testosterone levels, and essentially what they find is there's no difference at all uh, between them, uh, between homosexual males and heterosexual males. So that would indicate that pubertal levels of testosterone doesn't really matter uh, in terms of sexual orientation. Uh, other studies <clears throat> have taken a look at adult levels uh, of testosterone and male sexuality. <clears throat> and those studies uh, also show no relationship. In other words, um, take a look at avowed uh, male homosexuals, adult homosexuals, and avowed um, um, uh, male heterosexuals, take a look at their testosterone levels, and again, no differences at all between them. So those studies would apparently suggest that uh, this hormone testosterone really plays no role in sexual orientation. But it doesn't really rule out what might be happening much earlier in life, namely during prenatal life, fetal life. Uh, and indeed, um, uh, testosterone exposure during that very early period of sexual differentiation might be exerting an influence on sexual orientation. And what we need to do is we need to take a look at the studies that um, uh, will help us understand um, that uh, uh, relationship. So um, I'll talk a little bit about um, some experiments that were done some years ago uh, by a researcher at Villanova University uh, by the name of uh, Ingeborg Ward. And these studies involve taking pregnant rats, uh, like what you see here, and placing them into this very confining tube uh, and place them in there for a period of three hours a day during the second and third trimester of their pregnancy. Uh, expose them to very hot lights, and then um, uh, ask the question, what impact does this have on their developing male fetuses? That is, once they are born, then grow up into an adult life, um, does this have an impact at all upon their sexual behavior? So this is a very interesting study. Essentially what they're doing is they're asking uh, whether or not stress uh, to the pregnant uh, female uh, might be exerting some kind of an impact, maybe a change in hormones, a change in some kind of chemicals within the brain, or a uh, change in some other physiological process that uh, might uh, actually disrupt uh, uh, sexual behavior and sexual orientation. So when we look at studies like that, um, 
Uh, and again, this is a study that was done quite a while ago, but I think it's still one of the most important ones in this area. Uh, if we take a look at uh, males uh, that, uh, again, were exposed to this uh, stress uh, during their fetal life by virtue of the mother being in that very confined situation while they were uh, pregnant, that very stressful situation. If we take a look at what happens in terms of those males once they have the opportunity during adult life, uh, to exhibit uh, sexual behavior, to exhibit copulation. What you see is that in prenatally stressed uh, males, they show a much lower level uh, of uh, copulatory behavior than do uh, uh, males that were in this control condition in which they uh, were not um, exposed to that very stressful uh, experience in, in their mother's womb. So you can see that about 70% uh, of these uh, control animals are exhibiting perfectly normal sexual behavior and a much smaller percentage uh, in the case of uh, animals that were prenatally stressed. Let's disregard this uh, that we see right here. It doesn't really have a bearing at all on this uh, experiment or on other experiments, but this is a situation in which the males, uh, instead of being prenatally stressed, were stressed during the postnatal. Uh, period. And ostensibly, this is having no effect whatsoever. So let's confine ourselves then to the prenatal stress situation and the control situation. And again, we get a substantial reduction in the sexual behavior of these males. Many fewer of them are exhibiting copulatory behavior. Now, if we look uh, at the percentage of these males again, that were prenatally stressed, the percentage of them that, that actually ejaculated with, uh, with a female. We can see that, uh, again, a very low percentage of, uh, uh, of these males um, uh, actually ejaculate, whereas control condition is, is, is pretty high. Uh, so again, this is a, you know, a highly significant difference that we see here. But now let's also do this as Ward did um, in her very study. Let's take a look at what happens when we measure the degree to which these males that have been prenatally stressed, when we uh, uh, examine them for female-like behavior, that is their ability to show lordosis, Remember that intense arching of the back that you see in the case of a normal female that helps uh, the male uh, in terms of their sexual behavior. What we see uh, <clears throat> when we explore those animals that were prenatally stressed, <clears throat> challenge them with the hormone uh, uh, estrogen, what we see is these prenatally stressed animals, males are you know, exhibiting very high levels of this lordosis behavior in contrast to controls, okay? So, you know, this is very interesting. I mean, it's suggesting that uh, the brain of the male um, has not been properly masculinized. And what it's also uh, suggesting is that the brain has not been uh, properly defeminized. Um, that is to say, the, the brain seems to be more female-like in terms of its appearance because these uh, prenatally stressed males, uh, we can induce them to show this female-like behavior relatively uh, easily. So uh, that, again, suggests that the brain has not been uh, properly masculinized and that it has not been properly defeminized. So this is an especially when Ward uh, then in a later work uh, begins to explore what happens to this all-important hormone testosterone during this uh, early uh, uh, period of time, this period of sexual differentiation that's uh, occurring again uh, during uh, that fetal period of time. This shows um, uh, um, the, uh, the levels um, uh, of uh, the hormone testosterone in normal males, stressed males, and normal females uh, during this last, you know, four days uh, of, uh, uh, last three days of, uh, of fetal life. 
And the thing that I want you to see here is this. In the red is a stressed male. And what you see is they show a peak of testosterone on day 17. Uh, that is, this is a few days before uh, uh, the, the female actually delivers uh, those uh, uh, males. Um, and so it peaks on day 17 and then it goes down. That is in a normal, uh, uh, or that is in a stressed male. In a normal male, that peak doesn't occur until a day or two later. Uh, and in a normal female, their uh, testosterone levels are relatively low. So what that indicates is that um, this, uh, uh, this is a premature uh, testosterone elevation that you see. And it may be that the brain simply can't adequately respond to the testosterone at that period of time and hence the brain has not become uh, fully masculinized. Um, uh, this is a, a very important study uh, because it's one that uh, once we, we start traveling down this road of what is happening during prenatal life um, uh, is giving us some suggestions that there's something about the way in which the brain has been organized. There's something about um, this uh, very important uh, male hormone, testosterone, that's involved in masculinizing the brain. And it seems that in these stressed males, that brain is not really being fully masculinized. Again, just a theory, uh, but one that increasingly is backed up by other um, a scientist, a German scientist by Gunter Dorner, explored in a very interesting study in humans um, this concept. Uh, he examined uh, male homosexuality in the male offspring of women who were in the last trimester of their pregnancy during this very stressful period of time during World War II when Berlin was being bombed almost 24 hours a day by the Allied troops. So again, these women are pregnant. They're in this uh, uh, living uh, in uh, Berlin. Berlin is being bombed, uh, an incredibly stressful period of time. They're carrying um, uh, a fetus, uh, a male fetus uh, during this period of time. And what Dorner finds is that uh, those offspring showed a higher than normal incidence of male homosexuality. Uh, and indeed, that's, that's fascinating because it suggests, you know, like the, the uh, rat studies that I mentioned to you, that uh, there, there's maybe something that's happening in terms of disrupting or limiting uh, the amount of testosterone that the male brain is being exposed to. Take a look at this very interesting study it's one that was done um, by a researcher by the name of Gladdu and published, again, a number of years ago. These are older studies um, uh, in a very prestigious journal, Science. Uh, and essentially what um, Gladdu is doing in this study is this. He's exploring what happens in female heterosexuals, male heterosexuals, and male homosexuals when they are challenged with this synthetic hormone that's called Premarin, that's synthetic estrogen. Now, typically what you see when uh, a female mammal is exposed to, um, to estrogen, in this case, to synthetic estrogen, is that they show a rapid rise in the level of the hormone LH, luteinizing hormone. That's ordinarily what estrogen does, is it stimulates the release of luteinizing hormone from the brain. Well, take a look now at what happens when we measure the levels of luteinizing hormone uh, in female heterosexuals, male heterosexuals, and male homosexuals. Okay, this is in, in, in humans. This is work that's conducted in humans. And what we see, first of all, in the case of uh, female heterosexuals is what you would expect. Um, you get this incredible rise that occurs in luteinizing hormone. That's in a normal female. What you see in the case of um, a heterosexual male, that's this brown line that you see here, is very little response at all. Again, this is all over the course of a 96 hour period of time. 
This, of course, is levels of luteinizing hormone. And what you see in the case of um, uh, uh, male homosexuals is that they show an increase. It's not the same as what you would see in the female heterosexual, right? That's this line right here. Um, but it is substantially higher than what you see in the case of a male heterosexual. So in other words, this line, this secretion of luteinizing hormone is more female-like than it is male-like in terms of its appearance. Now, what does that suggest? It suggests that the brain of a male homosexual is uh, has not been fully masculinized. If it was fully masculinized, then you wouldn't see a response to luteinizing hormone at all. Or, or excuse me, you would not see an LH response to this uh, estrogen treatment um, at all. Uh, so indeed, this suggests that the brain of male homosexuals is not fully masculinized. Okay, so this is again a very, fits very well not only with the other human data, but fits very well with the uh, other um, animal uh, data. Take a look at yet another study. This is one very famous study <clears throat> that was um, conducted by uh, the psychiatrist right here. His name is Simon LeBay. And what LeBay does is he takes a look at the brains of heterosexual and homo homosexual um, uh, males and compares it with that of heterosexual females. And one of the things that he finds is that in one part of the hypothalamus, it's, it's larger in the brains of heterosexual men than in homosexual men or in heterosexual women. Um, take a look at this figure that you see right here. This shows the volume of uh, um, uh, a, a nucleus uh, within the uh, uh, hypothalamus. Uh, here's the level in, uh, here's the volume in a heterosexual female. Here's the volume in a heterosexual male. Again, heterosexual males, much uh, larger volume uh, of that nucleus in the hypothalamus. And now let's take a look at homosexual males. Homosexual males have a brain hypothalamus that is more similar to heterosexual females than to heterosexual males. Now there's some problems with this study. First of all, it's a very small sample size. And secondly, um, the male homosexuals that were in this study were all uh, patients who died from AIDS. Uh, and indeed, the, that alone may have impacted their brain in some important ways. But importantly, LeVay, he's not proving at all that homosexuality is genetic. He's not saying that there's a genetic cause for being gay. He didn't show that gay men are born that way, nor did he locate what we would call a gay center in the brain. But this is really correlative research, but it's very interesting correlative research because it, it gives uh, some support for those studies that we already took a look at uh, that suggested that um, one of the things that happens in the brain of a homosexual male is that it's not fully masculinized. Uh, so indeed, you know, this is a, a provocative uh, study uh, by Simon LeBay. Um, let's now focus our attention on lesbianism. And there's three pieces of research I want to talk about. Uh, work that was done by John Money and Anka Earhart on a syndrome that's called the adrenogenital syndrome. And um, the fact that there's elevated lesbianism uh, in this uh, particular syndrome. Then the uh, very important work of Bailey and Pollard, which is uh, really probably the pivotal study in this area. It's concordance research. Uh, we will explore that, and we'll also explore the very interesting case of what's called John Joan uh, uh, that was done uh, by John Money, uh, as well as um, a researcher by the name of Diamond. Uh, a very, very famous um, uh, study. 
so let's take a look at these different areas. Let's take a look at this syndrome that's called the adrenogenital syndrome. Uh, take a look at the uh, left-hand portion of this slide, and it shows the relationships between the hypothalamus, the pituitary gland, and the adrenal cortex. And this is as it occurs in, in normal uh, females. Um, the anterior pituitary gland secretes this hormone, ACTH, which then stimulates the adrenal cortex. And the adrenal cortex then secretes this hormone, cortisol. Cortisol gets into the blood, works its way back up to the brain, uh, where it is, uh, it is going to inhibit. It's going to suppress uh, a future um, uh, ACTH uh, release from the anterior pituitary. In a condition that's called the congenital adrenal hyperplasia, CAH, very frequently you'll see that acronym, we refer to it as the adrenal genital syndrome. What happens is way too much ACTH gets released from the anterior pituitary gland. And what it does is um, it, it's uh, uh, causing um, uh, a, a reduced cortisol synthesis, but greater than normal um, testosterone secretion. It's called androgen here. We use those words interchangeably. So you have this extremely high level of testosterone that's being secreted. It's being secreted at a relatively early period of time uh, in life. Um, and what happens is um, this uh, hormone, uh, the testosterone, gets in the circulation and it virilizes the external genitalia. Uh, this is um, the uh, uh, clitoris uh, of a female, uh, CAH uh, female, adrenal genital syndrome female, and you can see that this is, uh, you know, almost penis-like in appearance. And it may be that that hormone is also once it gets into the blood right, at these high levels, it's maybe impacting the brain as well and masculinizing the brain. So what we know about this syndrome is this, these congenital adrenal hyperplasia females are much more likely to be uh, a lesbian. Um, that is, you know, if they're diagnosed with adrenal genital syndrome, it, it uh, many of these females end up um, as lesbians in comparison to a, a normal female. So again, this is a very exciting, very interesting uh, study. But uh, some of the best research in this area conducted out at the University of Minnesota by Bailey and Pollard. Uh, and essentially, this is a concordance study where they're taking a look at uh, homosexuality in both males and females, and they're examining it in both identical twins and fraternal twins. So when we take a look um, at uh, homosexuality in, in males, uh, these uh, you know identical twin pairs, um, uh, when um, uh, one member uh, of that identical twin pair is diagnosed uh, as being homosexual. 52% um, uh, of the time, the other male will, uh, the co-twin, will also be um, uh, uh, found to be uh, homosexual. When we take a look at fraternal twins, on the other hand, um, it's, it's only a 22% concordance rate. So you compare this to this, and that's a highly significant difference that we see here. And that suggests that um, homosexuality may be due in part to an underlying uh, genetic uh, reason. Take a look now at um, uh, lesbianism in females, same thing, concordance research. Take a look um, at um, concordance in identical twins. 48% uh, of the time when one uh, female has, has been uh, found to be uh, homosexual, found to be uh, lesbian, 48% uh, uh, of the time the other one will be too. Okay. Um, fraternal twins, uh, on the other hand, um, 
again, a very low concordance rate, only 16%. This is a highly significant statistical difference. So again, in both males and females, um, uh, gay males and females, um, it appears as though uh, there is an underlying uh, genetic cause. So this is, uh, you know, really important research in this area, this concordance uh, research. Um, now the famous case of John Joan. Um, this is an individual whose real name was David Reimer, but for a very long period of time, um, uh, this case was simply called John Jones. So here's the, the basis uh, of this. This is back in the 60s and 70s. Uh, David Reimer, and this was a book that was written about this case. It's called As Nature Made Him, the Boy Who Was Raised uh, as a Girl. Um, here's how this very famous case went. Um, this was an individual that was um, uh, born a boy. Uh, but was raised as uh, a girl. Uh, and the reason why uh, he was raised as a girl was that there was an accident that occurred uh, during circumcision when uh, his penis was burned off and the decision was made to raise him as, uh, as a girl. Um, and indeed, um, when we take a look uh, at this, and examine what happened uh, to this uh, boy, at, uh, this, ge this genetic male that is now being raised as a female. Um, it's an it's a absolutely fascinating story. So here's uh, the mother uh, holding um, the two males. Um, uh, this is, uh, you know, within a few months after birth. Um, and then the decision uh, is made to raise one of them uh, as a female. And that is uh, obviously this one right here. Here's the co-twin right here in the background. Um, and uh, here she is, um, um, who, was, who was clinically called Joan, okay, but the name uh, Brenda was actually given to her as she was being raised in Canada. Um, and the individual who consulted on this case at Johns Hopkins University uh, was the very famous clinical endocrinologist, John uh, Money. So um, as uh, this uh, uh, girl uh, grows up uh, in Winnipeg, uh, Canada, um, uh, he faced cruelty from other children. Um, he uh, was uh, very unhappy um, uh, in terms of his gender uh, of assignment, which was female. Um, and um, uh, he later on discovered the truth uh, from his parents uh, that uh, this was all due to an accident that occurred uh, during circumcision and the decision was made to raise him um, as a, uh, a female instead of a male. Um, and um, at that time, uh, this is uh, at about 13 years of age, 12, 13 years of age, Again, this is uh, David David Reimer, again, being uh, given the name Brenda, uh, uh, makes the decision that uh, he no longer uh, wants to uh, be raised as a, as a female. Instead, would like to revert back to his uh, real gender uh, of male. Um, and this is him a few years uh, later. Uh, and this um, is a picture of him uh, actually marrying uh, a woman, a Canadian woman, um, uh, and adopting uh, her three children. Uh, when you take a look uh, at this very famous study, um, this very famous case study, uh, it's one that attracted uh, a great deal of attention. Um, you know, his uh, apparently one of the things that happened was that this boy <clears throat> became very depressed, um, ultimately separated from his wife, tried to commit suicide a number of times, and then finally was successful. 
um, but always uh, uh, from the, the point from about seven eight years of age always felt uncomfortable uh, and indeed experienced uh, a lot of problems in terms of uh, social adjustment and uh, felt all along that something was was not right um, John Money um, believed uh, that this was uh, really the perfect way to test uh, the degree to which nature and nurture uh, are responsible for um, sexual orientation and one's uh, uh, identity in terms of gender. So again, uh, the famous case of John Joan, here's John Money who, who studied this. Um, you know, you have these identical twins from the same womb. Um, again, we have this accident that occurs uh, in terms of the penis being burned off. So now we're going to take one of those males and we're going to raise it as female. Um, so again, they have different nurture. One's being raised as male, one's being raised uh, as female. And John Money believed that this was the perfect test case to explore the degree to which uh, hormones, uh, uh, you know, and, and, genet and genes uh versus the environment um uh, the degree degree of importance so money reports then that joan was a successful girl uh, he said they touted that success as being nature as being nurture over nature that the environment the gender of assignment is a crucial factor it doesn't really have anything to do with your biology um, and indeed, he wrote about this uh, extensively, and this really became the foundation for how certain conditions are treated. Things like micropenis and accidental penile amputation during infancy, which is what happened in the case of David Reimer. Uh, and again, this was used um, as the, 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 the method then to treat these kinds of, of, of cases. Um, but uh, John Money, uh, for reasons that are still unknown, didn't really pay as much attention as he should to what was happening to the social adjustment of David, David Reimer, uh, and indeed believed all along that he could make this genetic male into a female simply by um, uh, having uh, uh, the parents, you know, constantly reinforce um, uh, uh, femaleness uh, to uh, the developing child. Um, so along comes a researcher by the name of Milton Diamond. Milton Diamond now begins to extensively uh, look back at a lot of the records uh, that were maintained on this very famous case. Uh, and comes to believe that, um, you know, it's really not anything about nurture. Instead, it's about, you know, prenatal genetic and hormonal influences that are so important in predisposing an individual at a very early age, you know, by the time of birth, to be either male or female in terms of their sexual identity. Um, Diamond believed, again, after looking at all these records and seeing all along that um, uh, David uh, Reimer really was not adjusting at all to being a female. That was still in many characteristics of a, of a male. Diamond comes to believe then that this, um, this built-in kind of bias is what happens um uh, with uh, with any child and that bias is one that's set in motion early in life by genes uh, as well as hormones so sexual behavior and gender role really are not neutral they are not without initial direction at the time of birth and this is related to exposure of the brain to the hormone testosterone so once that XY condition has been set in motion in terms of the secretion of testosterone during early life. You can't go back. So indeed, Diamond contrasts very sharply then with uh, John Money and um, advocates um, that uh, this very famous case is really uh, telling us that the most important factors are genes and hormones. 
uh, during early life, that it's not nurture, that it's not how you're raised uh, by your uh, parents in terms of uh, promoting one gender uh, over another, that you can't overcome this uh, prenatal genetic and hormonal uh, influences. It's fascinating uh, work. And I, there's a videotape that you should have watched uh, on this that I think could help you to, to appreciate and understand it even better. So what are we talking about here? In the case of human beings, we're talking about this organization activation model, which has become so important in terms of understanding lower animal behavior, that our brain is organized in a male direction during early life. Not only is our brain pushed in the direction, in the masculine direction, but it's also defeminized during that period of time. That's what testosterone does. And then we have this activational period during pubertal and adult life where testosterone continues to exert its effects in the male. So uh, again, this is a, you know, a, a very, very famous study. Equally interesting is some of the recent research that has come out on what's called fraternal birth order uh, in male homosexuality. One of the things that we know is that sexual orientation correlates with an individual's number of older brothers. So if you're in a large family, right, uh, the likelihood that you, if you're a male, the likelihood that you will, um, be homosexual is very much related to the number of, um, of older brothers, um, that you have. Right. So in a large family like the one that you see here, uh, the likelihood um, of you being uh, homosexual increases with each older brother that you have. So ordinarily <clears throat> in the general population, uh, homosexuality is about two to three percent of the general population. But with each older brother that you have in your family, and again, we're talking about biological siblings, okay? That increases the odds of homosexuality by 33% with each older brother that you have, okay? So again, this is a uh, fascinating data. Here, here it is in terms of uh, uh, taking you know, the probability, okay, of homosexuality. This is the number of older brothers. The more older brothers you have, the greater is the likelihood that you are going to be uh, homosexual. Uh, and again, this is in individuals who are right-handed and, uh, but not in individuals who are, who are not right-handed. Uh, so uh, again, that's fascinating in terms of how it's related to handedness. Um, so, um, it, again, observed in right-handed but not left-handed males, and there's no such birth order effects that occur in females in terms of uh, lesbianism. This is one of the most well-documented findings in the whole field of the study of sexual behavior. And of course, the question is, um, you know, what is all of this related to? Well, the theory on this thing called the fraternal birth order effect. And it all has to do with what is called the maternal immunization hypothesis. When a mother is carrying her first son, as we see here, the placental barrier protects um, each from exposure, okay, to the other's proteins. But there can be a mixing of blood, and it could occur at the time of delivery, that will expose the mother for the very first time to male-specific proteins, including those that are responsible for encoding the Y chromosome. Right? So it's as if the mother now is recognizing almost like this foreign substance for the first time. Okay. Now, her immune system is going to produce antibodies to those proteins, okay? And the placenta is gonna transport those antibodies to future offspring, okay, while they are in utero. So it's potentially gonna be impacting the development of later born sons, but not later born daughters, okay? So again, this is called the maternal immunization hypo hypothesis. So indeed, what is happening then is, you know, testosterone is not 
um, uh, exerting the kind of effect that it usually does in the case of, um, of a uh, um, firstborn, let's say male, right? And indeed, what it suggests is that the brain of the uh, male is not being fully masculinized, and it's related to uh, these antibodies, uh, to these proteins that are being produced. Um, and again, future offspring are going to experience that, hence they're not going to be as masculine. Uh, this is later born sons, okay? So again, it's a fascinating hypothesis and one which has now been repeated many, many times. Okay, and again, you saw some interesting um, videotape footage, you know, on uh, this particular effect called the fraternal birth order effect. Um, so here's a thought question, uh, you know, how should we conceive of sexuality and sexual orientation in, in light of this research that we have just reviewed? You know, how do we conceive? And um, I think you have to consider sexuality as being a, a continuum, uh, a continuum of preferences and experiences that go from being exclusively heterosexual to being exclusively homosexual, and then all of these things in between, right? So it's not um, um, just uh, black and white. Uh, it's not just one or the other. That We have all these gradations of sexuality, this continuum that we see here, right? So I think that's how we have to view um, so there's some important conclusions here. Again, there's growing evidence that genes and hormones are involved in sexual orientation in humans. And a lot of the data with lower animals backs this up. Um, and um, think about this for a few moments. Um, if this is true, if this is in fact a natural condition, if this is something that is really a product of our biology, that it's about uh, uh, nature, uh, that uh, sexual orientation is a product of these, you know, biological factors that occur within us, whether it's hormones or genes, then we're really obligated to use those findings to eliminate what we could only call discriminatory, you know, social policies and practices. And we should make responsible changes in social policy based upon this kind of science, right? So indeed, uh, I think it's uh, important work, but I want to caution you. Um, even though we're saying that genes and hormones, you know, are nature, very important, there may be unknown environmental factors that potentially contrib contribute to this sexual orientation. We simply don't know, right? But more and more, there's data coming out suggesting that it's in our biology. Um, that the, the brains of um, males and females are different from one another, that when we look at sexual orientation, when we take a look at homosexuality, when we take a look at homosexuality in males, when we take a look at lesbianism in females, that it's very much related to uh, genes and very much related to uh, hormones. So in